Because the notion of control is so perplexing, it might be worth discussing uh, a specific example in which the attitude we take as we try to come up with a description of a system influences the description we come up with. So we're going to begin with a worked example of a system which we understand in full. This example comes from the early days of steam engines. James Watt, famous inventor of the steam engine, introduced a device for controlling the pressure, steam pressure within his system, called a centrifugal governor. And it looks, as you see on the slide, there's a central spindle, and there are two weighted balls hanging off this um, they're connected via a series of bits and bobs to the steam engine proper, which is hardly shown here. But the important thing is that the governor can rotate, and it rotates depending on the amount of pressure in the steam engine. So the steam pressure in the engine, off to the right, is spinning, causing the centrifugal governor to spin. Now, as it spins, those arms go up, and the centrifugal force. And as they go up, they open a valve which reduces the steam pressure. So they go down. So the pressure rises. So they go up. So they end up in a nice homeostatic balance in which steam pressure is maintained within limits. Not dissimilar to the way a thermostat works in the house. The arm angle is proportional to steam pressure and it also affects steam pressure. From the point of view of the engineer designing the steam engine, this is a godsend. This keeps the pressure within the entire system within certain viable limits, um, ensuring that the steam engine works properly. Very clever device. Now we know everything about this. We know how it works and everything. But supposing we didn't. Supposing we came upon this. The steam engine links to a controller and they're both black boxed. So we can see the outside of them, but we don't know what's inside these boxes. There's one part there that we've called control. That's what a governor means, really, is control. And then there's the steam engine. And supposing we approached this with that view in mind, how would we go about describing it? Well, we could come up with a description, a task description for that control unit that would look something like this. Measure the speed of the flywheel. Compare the actual speed against the desired speed. If that's in order, that's fine. If not, measure the steam pressure. Calculate the desired alteration to the steam pressure. Adjust the valve. And go back to step one. It's a very simple algorithm, easily expressible in code. This is a computational solution, and it gives meaning to the job of the controller. And it bears very little relation to what's actually going on, because we know everything about this system. There is no such computation. So a computational account is possible and may be descriptively adequate, particularly when we require that the description separate the roles of the controller from the controlled. Notice that in the mechanical device itself, that distinction is not given. They are continuously coupled to each other. The governor is as much part of the whole thing as is any other part of the steam engine. So that that distinction between controller and controlled is one that we imposed on it in advance. When we know how the thing operates, when we know the continuous lines of flow, the causal processes that link the angle of the arms of the governor with the steam pressure inside the system, then that division becomes problematic. So there are other ways of describing exactly the same situation, which are more insightful. And the natural language used to describe a system like this is informed by physics and mechanics, and is described using the mathematics of dynamical systems, which describe rates of change in things. Now, in the case of the steam engine, we actually know, we, we, we have license to attribute goals because, well, we designed the damn thing. So the engineer decided this is the controller and this is the controlled. From the perspective of the machine itself, there's no distinction between these two. So we need to introduce a subtle distinction here, one that is almost never respected. 
There's the domain of operation of the system, in which you just have a bunch of parts mechanically connected going through their causal processes. And then there's the domain of our description of the system. Now, because the steam engine is designed by a human, the domain of description of, of the system will contain necessarily the understanding of the engineer of the system, and the system designed this to control that. That's a different domain. The domain of our description of the system is different from the domain of operation of the system. That's a rather deep point. It's very common to confuse these two. And when we come at the brain and its role in within the body, within the world, we're faced with this kind of problem, but we don't have the engineer's prior knowledge. <laughs> there is no engineer anymore. So that we can attribute the role of controller to the brain if we have decided in advance that that's what it is, but we won't find anything in the body that um, insists that that's the right way to look at things. We've learned a lot from robotics, and we only have time for a few little examples in this. But here's a roboticist called Ralph Pfeiffer, and he's going to illustrate a variety of robots, which are all controlled in the same way, but which generate very different behaviors. I'll let Rolf take it away. Now, I'm going to show you a few behaviors. And whenever you observe a particular behavior, the question arises, as to what the underlying mechanisms are that bring this behavior about. So now here's one that I like very much. We call him Crazy Bird. There's another one. So the question is now, what is the, what are the mechanisms or what is the control that's actually underlying the behavior of these creatures? Now, uh, it turns out that, and of course we know because we built the, we built the, the systems, uh, this is the control. So it's basically just the wheels turning at a constant speed. Okay, now if you remember Crazy Bird, it was doing all sorts of things, but the control is just this. And by the way, the control for all of these three creatures is exactly the same, but they do very different things. So the diversity in the behavior of Crazy Bird cannot possibly be due to the diversity of the control, because the control is, I mean, you can hardly call this control. It's just these wheels turning at a constant speed. So why would you call it control? Well, because it's the animating force. That's what causes the motion. That simple rotation of a single wheel, identical in all three robots, is playing the role of the puppeteer. But it's not really controlling anything. We get very differentiated effects, but those differentiated effects come about because the bodies are built differently. Here's an example of another robot with no brain whatsoever, no control. This is driven by gravity. Gravity provides the animating force. He's walking down a ramp and the control where is the control? Gravity provides the animation and the robot walks because it is constructed very, very carefully. It's constructed to work with gravity and to produce the overall effect. This can seem like magic. And there's a term here that we need to be very careful of, and the term is called emergence. When we have multiple components, let's say a bunch of legs on a millipede, a bunch of limbs on a quadruped, bunch of parts on a robot and those components are themselves animated and they are subject to particular constraints then we may see a pattern arising which is very real but it sits one level above the components this notion of emergence is very very important it's used in order to remind scientists that domains of description need to be appropriate to the phenomena in question. And so if you're trying to understand a traffic jam, for example, you don't start with the individual car. The car doesn't cause the traffic jam. Multiple cars cause the traffic jam. The traffic jam is an emergent phenomenon.
A tornado gives you a good example of a dynamically individuated emergent pattern. Nobody designs or controls it. It happens when there's a lot of energy, so a lot of things are moving around, and the right constraints come together. Those are the atmospheric conditions that are conducive to a tornado. And then a tornado emerges. Here's a little video to help you remember this jargon, and it features puppies. Scotty Pinwheel! Scotty Pinwheel! stop them there. You'll remember those puppies, won't you? The puppies are components in this case, and each one is excitable. They're little puppies. Puppies are excitable. That means there's a great deal of energy. And then there's a constraint, and the constraint is the feeding dish. Put those energetic components together with the appropriate constraints, and you get the pinwheel pattern. There's nothing unreal about the pinwheel pattern, but you couldn't say anything about the pinwheel pattern couldn't be discussed. It doesn't exist in the absence of both the components and the constraints. So the puppies are components. The pinwheel is the emergent pattern. The feeding dish is the constraint. And driving it all is the source of energy here is the excited feeding behavior of puppies, each of whom is more or less autonomous, each of whom generates movement themselves. Now, these principles of emergent pattern don't lead directly to design principles, for example, for locomoting robots. An awful lot of work had gone, it has to go in in order to um, make these manifest in any system we might build. But People have been on the job, and you've probably seen these videos from the company called Boston Dynamics. They know more about this than anybody else. Let's just look at one humanoid robot here. He's showing off. Remarkable, fluid, coordinated movement. Together with scary soundtrack. I'm going to stop them right there. Now, Boston Dynamics do know a lot about robotics, and what they've learned is you have to make a robot with smart parts. That is, the actual concrete instantiation of the body is suited to the environment in which the robot is going to work in is absolutely essential. Roboticists learnt the hard way not to start with fantasies of control, but to start by looking at the fit between the embodied being they were creating and the environment in which it would work. Unfortunately, most of Boston Dynamics works has always been done secretly, has not been shared with the general community. Uh, Boston Dynamics originally worked only for military contracts and their first humanoid robot was made for testing chemical warfare suits. So all this work has been done by the military, all secretive. The company was bought by Google, I think, in 2013 and then sold on a few years later to a bank. So it's still not particularly open. So as we've seen, the notion of control raises questions. And we started with puppets much like the puppet up in the top left, four degrees of freedom, you can see that complex movements can result from even simpler control systems. The top middle picture shows just one button push that causes the whole body to move because of the way the body is built. But you can see the top right and the bottom left illustrate some very, very large robots. I'm going to, uh, sorry, puppets. And we're just going to have a look at them. They come from a company called Royal Deluxe, and I strongly recommend you check them out on YouTube. The video I have here is 10 minutes long. It's too long to show here in this lecture. So, turn that down. How do you make a huge robot, a puppet, I 
keep confusing puppets and robots. How do you make a huge puppet walk? Do you control it? Does one person control it? Well, when the puppets are this size, you need very, very many controllers. And I'm going to skip around on this. There's a huge dog. Multiple people doing the control. The astronaut and the little girl are, of course, huge. Let's skip forward to where we can see them. This is how they're, so to speak, controlled. People jumping off large scaffolding rigs, pulling large ropes in order to make the body parts move. They're a tremendously impressive sight if you ever see any of Royale Deluxe's puppets. But notice that there's no single locus of control. Here we have the very essence of distributed control. There's many, many parts. All the puppeteers are components in a big system, and the puppet is a component in the big system, and the locomotion of the puppet is the emergent pattern that arises from their interaction. Seriously, check out Royals and Looks if you ever get a chance to go to one of their shows.